Hi, I just did an interview with Faruja at Shattered Reality Podcast, and she was great. She is great and was great to do this interview with me because I really wanted to get her views on this evil stuff I've been looking into. So she doesn't have a YouTube channel, so I'm posting it here, but you can also find this on her Shattered Reality Podcast. Here it goes. And how about this? How about this? Here, I'm going to share the screen for a minute because I wanted to something here i was looking for stuff on ferusha and i found this you're so big time this is probably nothing to you but look at this yeah oh like shelton and jimmy fallon from two years ago i did um the tonight show with jimmy fallon who's got to be the most lovely person imaginable you know Just that's nice time. of you to say because I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because he seems like you hear a lot of stuff you know about everybody but he seems nice but that was so so cool that you uh that you did that he's really talented he really deserves where he's gotten he is fairly local he comes from upstate new york people i know know people in his family um He's just a very, very lovely, genuine person. And he's not gotten where he's gotten because of any sort of nepotism. He is a true talent. And I can't praise him enough in terms of that. He's really a true talent. That's awesome. You know, and one other thing, and this is great because I can include this in on, on my portion of the feed and not, you don't necessarily have to do it on, on yours, but... I honestly had a question about your show because I love your show and I stopped listening to it because it wasn't coming through my feed anymore and it kind of got cut off and now it's rebooted. I don't even know if it's rebooted, but I missed a lot of these later shows. I'm going through them really fast, but you have just some terrific shows and I guess the silver lining for me is there's a bunch of them that I haven't listened to, but what's going on with Shattered Reality? Well, Shattered Reality has been um, around for about four years, almost five years coming up. And um, we have temporarily, I hope, lost Kate Valentine uh, due to, uh, you know, personal matters that she's going through and uh, we respect that and welcome her back when she's willing to come back, which we hope is soon. And, and who, uh, who is Kate? Who is Kate Valentine? Kate Valentine um, is a UFO enthusiast and she had a show called uh, the Kate Valentine UFO show. She also had a science related show, uh, the name of which, uh, you know, parascience kind of stuff that, you do too, and I, and we do together, uh, Kate and I. Um, but they were two separate shows, and she had she is a UFO experiencer, and she is more of a nuts and bolts person than I am. But we have been able to uh, meld our ideas and kind of bounce off one another when she was available. But right now, it's only me, and I am a slow but deep thinker alex so sometimes it takes me a few seconds to get I don't my know thoughts about together. slow i think you are a deep thinker i should uh, introduce you a little bit for the purposes of my show okay absolutely so alex sakaris is a successful entrepreneur who now hosts a very popular podcast called skeptico much of which is concentrated on consciousness um, and in addition, I want to say that he has written Why Science is Wrong about almost everything. Uh, and he's now putting the final touches on Why Evil Matters, How Science and Religion Fumbled, a big one. He is from Chicago, Illinois. He has an MBA from Western Illinois University and pursued a PhD at the University of Arizona. So that's Alex. And I would start my question of Alex with a very softball question, which is, um, 
Is there a reason why both of your books start with why? I mean, is that a really good marketing technique or has it just happened that way? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe I think I kind of got it stuck in my head or something. I, it wasn't super intentional, but it did, it, it did have a nice bit kind of to it. Um, We're hoping for a whole series of books about why. Why, Spen why, why? No, I, I, I don't really see that. And, and you know, this, uh, I, I never really even thought about doing the second book. But, you know, we should alert people here that you were so nice to do this interview because, Farusha, I reached out to you and I said, I'm working on this project, Why Evil Matters. And I really think you have something unique to offer on this topic. And that's why I wanted to make it this dialogue. And you were nice enough to kind of break with your format and say, yeah, we could just kind of have this conversation about it. Because I think oh, it's exciting to me. It's exciting, you know, something different. It's exciting something to me. You know, I've listened to so many of your so many of your interviews and I've thought, wow, you know, I'd like to hear more about Farusha. And you know, the guests are great. You have top-notch guests, but oftentimes I'd like to hear more about your experiences and what you've done. And you are, you know, highly acclaimed as a psychic and you've moved in some amazing circles in New York. And I, I don't think that that doesn't seem to have gotten to your head in terms of you're still out there in the trenches exploring, you know, doing shows on what's the latest, latest UFO research, what's the latest near-death experience research. And I think that's really cool because you're not like putting on this, you know, these airs of I'm a psychic. And psychic, I don't, you, psychic yeah. You know, oh, I, mean, no, I, I think that's terrific. I don't do that for this reason. Uh, well, I'm truly interested in the research. Um, and there was a woman who was a friend of mine and who I still hold dear on a certain level. And at one point, she's well known. She hangs around in very flashy circles. She was my client. And uh, she said to me, Farusha, who do you want to meet in the world? Do you want to meet Robert Redford or do you want to meet uh, some famous person? And I said, no, I really want to meet, um, I want to meet, like, who do I want to meet? Russell Targ. I want to meet Russell Targ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she said, who? Yeah. <laughs> she said, what was that? And other people, you know, other people uh, like Richard Smoley and people like that. I, I wanted to meet those people. She didn't know them. And that started uh, something going in my mind. And I said, if these people aren't famous to the average New Yorker, and they're, they're well known in their own fields, absolutely, then I can meet them too. And so I decided to just study up, join the Society for Scientific Exploration, join IRVA, because I'd done quite a bit of remote viewing through the Monroe Institute and the Omega Institute. And I just decided to do that. And I started writing blogs about it. And then podcasting happened. And it was really, really exciting. And so I got to meet a lot of these people. But unlike other psychics that I know, I don't really make any claims. I've been psychic on some level since childhood or intuitive. Let's just say intuitive because psychic has all kinds of strings attached to it. And I have to say, I don't know where it comes from. So many psychics say, well, I get my visions from the Mother Mary or I get my visions from Nostradamus or whomever. And I don't do that because I can safely and happily say, I don't know. But if I know 10% more about your life than you do, then I'm helpful to you. And that's all, that's, the, that's my major claim. Now on my website, it says about me visiting all these places around the world of energy. And that is true. I did visit lots of places and I hope to again, but we don't know in this time frame whether we'll get a chance to go back to the crop circles in England or anything like that. Oh, they'll, 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 they'll decide this is over in a little while and then <clears throat> eventually it'll have to get back to normal. They don't want to play this game for too long, but 
they're certainly playing it pretty damn hard right now. But I don't want to talk about all that. No, you know, no. you know what I think is is kind of interesting. Also, see, there's so much embedded in that story that maybe you take for granted, and that I, I love how humble you are about these psychic gifts. And I think we all appreciate on some level that we all have this ability or these various abilities, and that some people have them more. But I think you know, for you to do the Jimmy Fallon show and, you know, to go on late night and do the thing with Blake and Jimmy and to few people would number one, have the presence, the ability to just hold that place, you know, which is pretty remarkable. But then secondly, to have it not go to their head, you know, I mean, you're, you, you do seem grounded in a way. And I, I wonder how that what what that what that is in your background because I know a lot of your background you've always had this connection in your family right to these yes. kind of extended things so you yeah. how how are you what is that world view I mean you kind of alluded to it in general terms there but what is your world view about how this stuff does work um my view is that I don't exactly know and what I wanted to say to you in terms of some of that is that when I say I don't believe something, it also doesn't mean I, I might believe something, I, I don't believe or not believe something. That's what I'm trying to get out here. Um, I have my door open. Like when somebody, I'm going to use uh, somebody uh, that you know of, Gary Schwartz, Soul Phone, that whole deal. Okay? Exactly, exactly right. You know, I've met Gary Schwartz at the, at the SSE up in New Haven and seemed like a heck of a nice guy and I really liked him. I haven't met his partner who's been on uh, at, on uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump, which I, you, I got to through you. So I love that you... I listen to your shows, a lot of them, and now I listen to uh, Backgap, too, so that's really great. I wouldn't have found out about that except for you. But getting back to Gary Schwartz, soul phone. Okay, do I believe it? No. Do I not believe it? No. My jury is still out. And um, so that's the point of view that I come to a lot of this psychic stuff about I don't believe or disbelieve. Something is going on. And my base... See, but Purusha, I mean, I think because you understand the science and you've really delved into it with all these, a lot of the same great people that we both respect so much, I think I understand what you're saying, but I don't want to misinterpret you. Because like my take on uh, Gary Schwartz's work, and again, have a lot of respect for the guy, what he's gone through. He stayed after it. He has this super high academic profile and he's just willing to put that on the line and go in places after death communication is not going to win you brownie points within academia. And he's no. pushed and he continues to push. And just for folks who don't know, the soul phone is an extension of what Gary's been working on for a long time about after death communication. And he's just taking it one step further. He said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I can, photon beams are uh, doable now. I mean, I don't know what you have to spend, but it's not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can set up a little photon beam in your lab. And he said, why don't we set up a photon beam and see if this hypothesized disincarnated spirit can adjust, move, affect the photon beam when we ask questions. So we'll go to the extended realm, the dead, and we'll say, Aunt Mary, is it you? And then Aunt Mary can move the soul, move the photon beam or not uh, based on these yes, no questions. And they claim, and we don't have any reason to, do not, to doubt this claim, that they've compiled amazing, statistically just phenomenal data that this is true. Because true in the sense that they validate what they're getting back, being blinded from it, with a sitter that would then say, yes, you know, she did lose a ring before, you know, or whatever kind of questions you would validate when that we've seen that after death communication research. 
and it is very doable, you know, it's not super tricky scientifically. The photon beam is, is interesting. So here's, here's what I think we're talking about. I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. When you yes, say, patiently. when you yes. say you don't believe or you don't disbelieve, I'll tell you what I've always said about that, which again, it could fall into your category, but I'm going to make sure I'm not making assumptions, is I always say, it just sounds a little bit too much like, you know, God needs our help. You know, like God's up there. He wants to talk to you, but until he can get a good soul phone, you know, he just can't, he just can't make the connection. I go, I, I can't believe that's how it really works. So I don't question your data. I just question maybe some of the assumptions you're making, but then again, I'm glad you're out there exploring yeah, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I agree a lot with what you say. Basically, I don't disagree with what you say, but I think I'm coming at it from a different point of view. I mean, another part of it. And the part of it that I think I'm coming at from is that there are absolutely, I feel like, you know, consciousness is fundamental as, uh, as, as many of the uh, physicists have said. And not only that, but, um, you know, I think that um, we are more than our physical body, like Robert Monroe said. These are kind of basic things that are my foundation uh, of things that I can say I quote unquote believe. Then other things come into the area of I think this could be the way. Now, the other possibility with all of these after death communications is that there are other beings we could be you're sitting in your beautiful skeptical lounge with the paintings behind you which i love to ask you about we have to go back to that at another point in the interview but um, we're sitting in our living rooms perhaps i'm in mine and there could be a soup of thousands if not millions of beings circulating around us they may not be in the same time space continuum they could be on another vibrational level i'm talking science here and I, and i don't mean strict science that it's they're really on um, on dimension 72 or something like that i have no clue but what if these are just disincarnate entities some of which could be tulpas some of which could be discarnate entities like which cause ufo sightings for instance maybe but then there are physical traces oh my god what do we do with that you know but that's a whole other conversation but with people channeling the dead are you really speaking to aunt mary or perhaps there is somebody playing with you a little bit some being, some entity, um, whether it be an egregore or a tulpa or something entirely separate from you. And which brings me to something I was going to read for you. And I hope you'll give me a second to read this for you because it's from a famous Greek thinker named Pythagoras. And it says, as long as man continues to be the ruthless destroyer of lower living beings, he will never know health or peace. For as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, he who sows the seed of murder and pain cannot reap joy and love. And so that brings me into another part about what I think about. And I am not at all sure that human beings, and I admit to being one, slightly regretfully, <laughs> but I admit to being one, um, human beings may not be the top of the food chain. And perhaps we shouldn't disregard the consciousness of other things like trees, and like um, animals of all sorts, and even, and this is taking it a little far, but not so much, rocks, the sun could be alive. I mean, we both had on, um, oh, oh my gosh, my mind is failing me now. We both had on the famous uh, gentleman, from Rupert, Rupert Sheldrake. We both have interviewed Rupert Sheldrake, and he puts up a very good argument for the sun being alive. 
Um, and I don't, you know, anybody who wants to refer to that, they could go to either of our podcasts or his work, and they would find that, I'm sure. So you um, actually had a better dialogue with him on on that topic, because I wasn't aware of that until I heard it on your show. I I guess I had run across it, but I always kind of skipped over it. And you brought that out, I think, really nicely. I had the great pleasure of meeting him in Manhattan um, uh, for a lovely dinner, which uh, a a benefactor of mine helped me out with. In fact, the same lady who said, who do you want to (laughs) meet? And I, I said, uh, Russell Tarr. Rupert Sheldrick. <laughs> yeah, she, she managed to do that for me, which is marvelous. I can't thank her enough. If she ever listens to this, which I don't think so, but I do thank her. Well, I think, uh, I think Sheldrick is terrific. And I think, you know, I met him. Uh, I did meet him in, in person at, uh, at Eslin. He was up there doing a, a presentation and I managed to get up there and, and meet him. But before that, you know, I just kind of contacted him more or less out of the blue. And I always remember how kind of welcoming he was, how open he was. And I think that that, to me, really speaks to so many times, so many of the people that we find in this community who these frontier scientists, they're not all super open, but so many of them are just seem to be able to have that sense of people who were genuinely trying to pursue this path and they seem to be willing to kind of help them along that that way so i thought he was great same with dean raiden two you know giants in this field who are uh, just really naturally normally good human beings yeah. you know I, you said I, I, so I much there I haven't you had s- him on the show. <laughs> what's that i've met dean but i haven't had him on the show i think he's wonderful Dean yeah, Brady. you should definitely, you, you should definitely, that's a, oh my gosh, and I didn't realize that. I kind of assumed that you did, because especially the, the spirit work that he's doing and trying to bring that to the lab right now would be, that'd be a natural. So yeah, I agree. If, if you want any help, if, if you have any problem making that connection, please let me know and I'll try and help the best I can. So yeah. you, you said so much there. I think, I think your answer was actually incredibly, incredibly important to that whole line of inquiry with, uh, with the soul phone thing. And where you took it was just that something that I think we all intuitively kind of know, but we don't want to grapple with because it's so hard, is that the complexity of this extended consciousness realm, whatever that means, whatever that is, is undoubtedly so complex that it is really beyond our, our ability to fully grasp it. And I always say this, but, you know, isn't that what we hear from people who enter, fully enter that realm, like through an after-death experience, a near-death experience, those kind of things? They come back and, you know, routinely they'll say, I knew everything. I could no sooner bring a question to my consciousness than it was answered for me. But gosh darn it, I can't remember it now. I can't, it's like, I can't bring it down to this domain. And, and to me, that's what you were capturing beautifully with that answer, which is like, hey, it could be any number of different things that we kind of think we know something about. And each one would shade it very differently. So when we jump in there with a kind of a firm grasp that, oh, this is what it must be, you must be talking to Aunt Mary we really leave ourselves open for a lot of, you know, potential uh, confusion, creating more confusion for ourselves and other people. It would seem to me from everything that I've gleaned um, that maybe the, these entities that do seem to exist come in a variety of forms in terms of some are for us, some are against us, and some of us, some of them are just playing with us, like uh, the trickster, the joker. Um, thank you, George Hansen, who's a great guy. <laughs> have you interviewed jo- George Hansen? I'm- no, and we can have a talk about George Hansen. I don't know. I love the idea. <laughs> I love the idea. Give me trickster. Give me the idea. Let's leave behind some of his interpretations and some of the ways that he goes with it and everything becomes a trickster and, you know, and then he sees it from a social political standpoint. It's like. He's very private. 
I would say he's a private gentleman. And um, well, I, don't I like that as I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think he's he's I think he's stretching the trickster Maybe. thing a little bit. Yeah. Maybe. Anyway, anyway. That's a little skeptico comment there. I don't know. It's a great guy. No, he's added, hey, another guy completely got to respect the heck out of how he's changed the dialogue. I mean, Trickster is, is a, a cornerstone to all this that we didn't realize before, and we all have to acknowledge that's in play here. So, no, I don't need to run him down. He, he, he did no, a he's, great he's thing a there. guy in general, and um, I would say that... He, the thought about the trickster, if you think about it, the concept of the trickster would be that type of entity, which is just playing with us, as opposed to the one which wishes us well or wishes us harm or is trying to bring us down. The yeah, but other, see, see he, doesn't, he doesn't say that. See, like no. if he said it within the context of what you were saying, it would actually, I, I, I could buy into it more. If he said... Look, I don't know what the heck's going out there in this extended realm, but among all the different classifications we could make, there seems to be this element of it that doesn't, doesn't neatly fit into a, a benevolent angel kind of figure and doesn't fit into this demonic pull you into the darkness figure. There seems to be this element of it that is kind of playful, kind of, you know, what we wouldn't see in this realm of kind of being the trickster, and that meme seems to pop up over and over again. If you just said that and left it at that, I'd be like, wow, that's a great insight. But when you start seeing the trickster in politics and the trickster in, you know, our culture and, you know, the, the trickster culture, and we're moving into this age of, it's like, it's, it's lost now. Now it's like, you know, trying to Trying to pin it down too much or trying to use it, overuse it, but I, there I go. So yeah, I'm going to just beat up the guy for no reason, you know, good. Oh, great guy. Hey, you know what? Let I, me, let me return to another point you made. Cause I want to emphasize sure. this as well. And then, then we can talk about something else, but it's, it's so obvious on one hand. And on the other hand, we never talk about this. Like you extend it, just extend it to the animal domain. You know, like we talked about Rupert. Rupert and his dogs that know when their owners are coming home and cats, right? He said cats too. He said, I never talk about cats because, you know, I'm stuck on the dog thing and that's the title of the book and all this, but I got a ton of cats reports too, you know? So, you know, or then you go into the ocean and these people have these amazing experiences with dolphins, with whales, with sharks, you know, and they're clearly, the, the data is overwhelming that there's some kind of relationship that they have with, consciousness, the larger and larger sense that we don't have any clue of. And we're kind of tapped, like you said, we're kind of tapping into their abilities. We're tapping into that cat that goes, sits on the, on the lap of these people who are dying in, you know, uh, retirement homes. And the cat yes, knows. Yes. I remember okay. that cat in Boston, right? Tell this, tell the story. Well, there was a cat. Um, at a hospital in Boston, and the uh, people who worked at the hospital, uh, I he the cat was kind of in the hospice ward, if I'm not mistaken. I could be off on this a little bit, but um, and the cat would go into the room of the person who was going to die next. The cat just simply knew it. So the, the entire staff got with the program that the cat knew who was going to die. Now, how did the cat know that? Um, and then you get it, that gets into the whole death doula thing. I don't, I don't know if, uh, you know, you've, but the, the, routinely now that's a, a service that a lot of hospice facilities provide. And that is the death doula. And that is someone to go and be with the person as they're transitioning. Cause sometimes, you know, it's sad, but some people don't have anyone in their family to be there and they're there all in their room all alone. And sometimes they feel all the, the, we can only imagine what you feel when, you know, no matter who you think you are, when you actually enter, enter that zone of crossing over, it's got, and so people volunteer to go and just sit and be present. And sometimes those people, you know, like I interviewed a, a, a psychic, an amazing person who did some volunteer work. Her name is uh, Deborah Diamond, and she did volunteer work 
as a death doula and also as a psychic, although she kind of left that, you know, a psychic medium, I should say, she kind of left that at the door, but you can only imagine that works itself into the process of going and sitting with people as they're, as they're dying. So I kind of, that's how I always read that story about the cat. The cat is like the, the cat death doula, you know, of being there for that person in some way that we don't even understand. Well, they, they, some scientists have posited the idea that the person gives off a smell when they're close to oh, dying. Oh, please. Up on. I don't, I don't, I just have to put the skeptical, skeptical uh, point there over. But I have a wonderful, a wonderful story for you about a death doula person that I met uh, at the Monroe Institute when I first went there. I, I went to the Monroe Institute for the first time when my parents had died. I couldn't go before. I was an only child, I am an only child, and I had to take care of my parents as they were dying in various different ways. Um, paperwork as well as providing support, uh, uh, not financial, but uh, support, emotional support. So I got to go to the Monroe Institute after that was over. And there I met a man named Brother John. Brother John was um, a Catholic brother from the Archdiocese of Buffalo. And he was a very wise person, I would have to say. He exuded wisdom. And he supported me a lot in that um, gateway uh, Monroe Institute Gateway Program, the first program that people go to. And I found out about his background, which was totally mind-blowing. He was in Uganda during the massacre, and he was imprisoned with a bunch of clerical people, including Catholic priests, Protestant ministers, Catholic nuns, and um, Protestant sort of nun people, they're not always called nuns, but sisters uh, in, in, in Protestant, various Protestant religions. And he saw so much death, more people died there than came home. And when he came home to New York, I guess the Archbishop of New York or somebody of that ilk, and I'm not a Catholic and I'm not promoting Catholicism, but gave him like, what he thought was a cushier job, like he didn't have to, and he, he was sort of elevated to a higher position. He ran the Buffalo Catholic Hospice, and he saw so many people leaving their bodies and saw like the mist that uh, is described and helped a whole lot of people over the edge. So he was a very, very seminal and helpful person um, in my time of, uh, grief or not, I don't know if I would call it grief, but just trying to deal with my new reality of not having any parents and so forth. So oh, uh, that is an interesting death doula story, I think. It is. And it, it also kind of transition, uh, it transitions, uh, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that word. It transitions us into this topic that I really wanted to talk to you about regarding um, religion. Because, you know, you mentioned I'm um, working on this book, Why Evil Matters. Yes. And the premise of the book is really pretty simple. It's like, you know, you mentioned the first book, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything. And that book was like, hey, science, if you don't get science, consciousness right, I mean, if you think consciousness is an illusion, you really can't do science. You can't do anything because consciousness is there. We have to measure it in all these experiments. We have to factor it in. And we can put an asterisk by our work and say, I did the best I can, but I wasn't taking into account consciousness, whether that's in the form of the observer effect or whatever, you know. Okay, you get enough of that speech. You've, you've heard it before, probably skeptical. But the, the, the premise of why evil matters is that if we're going to consider this extended realm, which you and I talk about with such ease, you know, oh, you have your conscious minute, my minute and experience, but then there's this other realm and there's spirits and there's, we don't even know what they are, like you're saying, you know, these, these topa kind of thought creation things. There's all these other things that seem to be showing up. I'm going to put a label on that and call that extended consciousness. Well, my point is, 
we can't begin to talk about extended consciousness or our role in it or what that would mean in terms of this term we call spirituality with maybe a lens into that, maybe a way to jump into that is to look at evil because it seems to me we do such a terrible job. I mean, just, just a terrible job with evil. And I think religion is part of it, you know, because on one hand we have science that says, well, evil, evil doesn't exist because you know, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. They're kind of, you know, what are you even talking about? But then you have this other kind of subtle part of culture that we've talked about or you've explored and I want to talk about that kind of says, hey, yeah, there is evil. And look at my Netflix show about, you know, this. And let's look at uh, the Memphis Three and, you know, Johnny Depp. And, you know, Satanism is kind of cool, isn't it? You know, there's that kind of part. And then, the only other place we can go is to Brother John. Is that his name? The guy? Yes, it was Brother John. And I don't remember his last name. It, he has very little about him in the public forum. I once found out, I think he has a mildly German last name, like Ehrlich or something of that nature, but that's not it. Um, and, well, he's, uh, probably, he's probably a wonderful guy. He's probably incredibly spiritually enlightened, based on what you're saying and the experiences and all that. But geez, he's in this Catholic cult. You know, like one of the things I love about what you said, Virgil, I was listening to one of your interviews and you go, okay, and this person is this religion and you're very nice. I like it. New York, New Jersey accent. So yeah, this person is in, in this religion or you can call it a cult, either one, interchangeable. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like you just said that matter of factly, and I'm like, absolutely, interchangeably, matter of factly. Just because Brother John is in the Catholic cult doesn't mean that he's a bad guy, doesn't mean that he's a million times more spiritually enlightened than I am. He could be. But until we understand the cultish elements, I'll let that plane pass. Jeez, that's a lot. But until we, until we understand the, the cultish a aspects of, of those religions it, it, it's, it, and tease them out, you know, like I think you can be part of the, the Catholic community and not be highly influenced by the cultish part of it. I think the same with Christianity in general or any religion. You can find a way through that that doesn't totally weigh you down into the cult, but geez, when you talk to some of those people, they do, I, I feel like they're not willing to own the fact that a lot of the ideas they have are just straight out of the cult playbook and they don't make any sense rationally. And they're not approaching it from a scientific, or I love the way you said, I would put pre-scientific way. You know, you said, hey, I approached this like with the Monroe Institute and I tried to do it in a scientific way. I know it's not science per se, but try and do it in an organized, systematic, logical way that uses the, your best means of discernment without jumping into this, well, that's because that's what the Bible says kind of thing. I mean, I, I well, don't- Which Bible, I would say? Which Bible are you talking about? Is it Jimmy John's Bible of plain spoken Southern English? Or is it the King James Version? Or is it um, the Essene Version? Or did we learn to speak Aramaic somewhere along the line and really look at the stuff? In which case we find out that the devil wasn't really a big player in the early uh, writings. Uh, so you've got that. And then of course, um, you've got Richard Smalley, who you've quoted on your show uh, with his quote uh, about what, what re you know, Christian religion is and how does that really make sense that God is up there and sent his son to be tortured and, you know, threw everybody into lasting damnation because a woman ate an apple or whatever. I mean, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the Catholic Church, um, there's a couple of interesting things about the Catholic Church. Like, um, I think that a lot of medieval history, uh, they kept medieval history, which otherwise would be gone. However, it's probably not, uh, if I said tainted, that's too negative a word. I would say 
it's pushed in a certain direction, but at least we have some concept of what went on during medieval times, largely due to the record keeping of the Catholic Church. So, well, I mean, I mean, hold on, let me let me just interject because sure. you would be dead if at the at, during those times, right? A woman oh, yes, like you, be one, because you're a woman, two, because you would immediately be identified as practicing witchcraft, and you would be killed. And I yes. think that, you know, we can kind of, oh, ha, ha. No, no. that is that People tradition. People like kill me right now, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I, I guess that's what I'm saying in, in terms of owner, owning, you know, like, because I'm going to talk to, I got to, I'm interviewing a guy who's a, a, a super researcher. Love this guy. And he's done some amazing work on Crowley and on, on this satanism that's in our culture in such a strange way and people don't even realize they're they're entering into this this dance with i don't know what it is but it, i i just think there there isn't the awareness there and i don't think christians understand their culpability in it and their culpability in it is they've created such a mess with their crazy ideas that there's always going to be it's easy to, to rile someone up and pushing back and saying, yeah, why would they, why would they kill Ferugia? And then they will have some explanation for it. Or why would they be against gay marriage is a great one. You know, well, why do you think you have, why do you think your book has anything to say about what two adults do privately to express how they feel about it? How in the world do you think your book has any has any opinion on that? It's it's just a bizarre uh, uh, logic hole that we have a tendency to give a pass to and kind of say, well, those are your religious beliefs, and I guess I ought to respect your religious beliefs, and. I want to push past that a little bit, and, and, that, and that's what I'm we, attempting to do. Can we talk about gay marriage for a second? And, you know, I mean, gay marriage won't ruin your marriage. It's, you know, it's gay marriage. It's between two same-sex people, and that's just fine. As far as I'm concerned, I am certainly not against gay marriage. But I think that the, the language here is one thing that is wrong uh, with all of us because some people uh, look at the word marriage as a religious institution where other people look at it as a civil situation. Why does that matter? Why does either one matter? It matters a great deal. Let me explain. Um, if, if everybody had a civil union who went to the went and got a uh, certificate, if everyone had a civil union and left marriage to be something religious, this would maybe would never have come up. I, you know, oh, I, I don't care if it came up. I don't care if it came up. That that to me takes it in the wrong direction. Excuse me, Fruj, I get you, I get worked up. But it's like, no, I'll put it right in your face. Call it religion. What does your religion care? What is your what kind of religion do you have that you've made any sense of in your mind? And I'm not saying you, obviously, that you could somehow justify that this is something you need to stick your nose in. I'm I don't respect it. I don't have to respect that religious belief. I can challenge that religious belief in the court of public opinion and go, that's rather ridiculous, isn't it? I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, but I don't personally deal in religion. Well, that's my point. Trying. That's my point, I guess. I guess that's my point. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you is that you've, you've navigated that terrain. But when we look at it, I, I love that quote. You know, it's like you call it a cult, you call it religion. I don't care. It's a, <laughs> just the semantics thing. They're the same thing. You can't believe, you can't have faith that your wacky beliefs about gay marriage have any basis in some deeper spiritual truth unless you've subjected yourself to some kind of mind control, religious, social engineering project, which we're all subject to. I'm not immune from that. I'm sorry. I'm, I look back on the pictures of me way back in the day wearing bell bottoms and, you know, wearing hair or when I lived in Dallas, you know, having some cowboy boots on. I'm like I was socially engineered. I get it, you know, and I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. I get it, you know, and I went and kissed the priest's hand to get a little piece of bread because that's what I was told to do. I get it, 
But until Christians can come clean and go, wow, that really is, that really is cultish. That it really is trying to control my beliefs. Then, Alex, because the thing is, we can talk about Catholicism because it is a, an institution that has certain amount of things that are known about it. But there are a lot of people calling themselves Christians, and frankly, it baffles me in terms of any idea about Christianity. Not only that, but um, the basis of all this, people don't, people need to be led around. There are people who are followers. They mentally need some person or persons to look up to and be a follower of. Now, I think that you and I, primarily, we may have heroes, but we are not anybody's followers. I am not a joiner. You may not be a joiner either. Um, I have people that I hold in high regard, but I don't follow them. I think for myself, or at least I try to. And I do look at other people's ideas and I do adopt some ideas which seem to have um, hold weight for me, but I don't decide that they're true. I just find them to be interesting ideas. Fair enough. And, and well, I, I kind of took that from your larger body of work. And, you know, whenever I kind of get off on these rants and people get all upset because they feel like their religious beliefs are being trampled on. And that is exactly my intent. I don't think religious beliefs deserve any kind of special, special uh, uh, position in the court of public opinion. If you have a wacky idea, if you believe in flat earth, then you deserve, and you want to come out and publicly talk about that, you deserve to be kind of, <laughs> have those beliefs questioned. And I, I just think that in this little domain that I'm talking about now in terms of evil, and I guess that was a long rant, but let me bring it back to getting your opinion if I haven't totally... <laughs> contaminated the possibility of getting an objective opinion. But I'd like to explore the role that religion has played in obscuring our ability to understand really what's going on in this thing that we might call evil. But I guess before I can even get there, because that was my intent. So the lead up to that would be, you know, how do you even feel about evil? Because I know a lot of people are not even comfortable with the term. I've had people straight up say, I don't believe in evil. I don't believe evil exists. And what I'm working on, I'm not trying to uh, offer a, a definition of evil, which is where people always want to go. Well, do you think, you know, the, do you think the drone strikes were more evil than, than, you know, satanic ritual abuse? And it's like, why would we want to play that game of, you know, which is more evil? I, I point to, you know, I did an interview with, uh, with a wonderful woman. Her name is Annika Lucas. And I really connected with her because she's a yogi like me. And she has this amazing yoga program for incarcerated women in New York. She's really turned her life around because at six years old, she was sold into a satanic ritual abuse cult in Belgium. And as horrifying as that is for people to imagine at six years old, this is the Belgium cult that was all over the news in the 90s. I mean, if you want to go see, you know, just insane pictures of, they actually have pictures of the kids bound in cages. That's what they were doing. And this is the cult that Annika was sold into and almost died. I mean, should have died. Other children died in that cult. So I, I guess the reason I bring all that up is sometimes, you know, people need a know it when I see it kind of aspect of this. So you just talk about that case and they go, okay, I give up. Yeah, there is evil. <laughs> that's, that's evil. No question. So once we ground ourselves in the fact, and, but again, maybe you don't see that as evil, but if there is evil and we're going to get to evil, I think religion's getting in the way. Well, largely I would agree with you. I would say the following. I would say that, there are different points of view as to what is evil in terms of, I think it's evil to kill um, elephants, for instance. I think that's horribly evil. I think 
big gabe hunters are, are like the scourge of the universe as they're very evil um but i would say that it, it depends on the point of view of the person doing the deed so that if you well doesn't that contradict with what you just said i mean if i'm if uh, imagine a hypothetical where I'm a, a starving or nearly starving, you know, hunter in Africa, and the only means I have of supporting my family and my community is harvesting ivory off of that elephant. And I, with all my power of and intention, pray for the, for the good life beyond this life for that elephant. And I go down and take them down and take that tusk. Am I doing evil? Um, I think that there are other ways to support oneself. No, that's not, that's not the point. The point is that individual hunter, are they, are they perpetuating evil? I cannot speak for that person. I cannot speak for that person. I find it to be an evil act, but I can't really speak for that person. Um, I see. Because here's what I think evil is. I can make it that people okay. keep pushing me for the definition since doing this book. And, and here's the, here's the definition I kind of play around with when I'm really pushed to throw it out there. If you're doing something that is intentionally soul crushing to use a word that doesn't really have a meaning, but we all know what it means. If you're trying to intentionally impede someone's spiritual progress at that fundamental level, then that's evil. Everything else is in this gray area, this huge gray area between the absolute divine highest thing and that, which is the lowest thing. That's my take on it. Doesn't sound like wrong to me, Alex. That doesn't sound like a wrong definition of it. Um, and I would find it hard to define evil like in 10 handy words, but I would say if you do something intentionally to hurt another being um, that you perceive as being alive, then that would be closer to my definition of evil in terms of a human point of view. Which then we get into the problem. Then we get into the problem of self-defense, and you know, even the Dalai Lama says, you know, if someone's coming and well, there's not, something else there that I would bring up as a question rather than as a point as my point of view, but more as a question. I would bring up the idea of this poor girl, uh, Miss Lucas, Annika Lucas, who I couldn't listen to because I just couldn't bear the thought of hearing about ritual sexual abuse. I couldn't listen to it on a certain level. Uh, but what I would say is if you or a person, let's say a man of sufficient means of physically to do something about it, was in a position to rescue this little girl and murder the person who was um, harming her, would you be more culpable if you didn't murder her, him than if you did murder him? I furthermore have never believed people. In my youth, I would run against people who would say to me, you know, I could never do anything bad. If my sainted mother was being murdered by a mob of angry people who wanted to rape her. I couldn't hurt them. I don't believe them. I honestly don't believe them. I say, put yourself actually in that position or don't, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that that is the way humans are wired. Now we can't get away from the point that as humans, we are animals, specifically we're mammals. And we have more in common with chimps and gorillas and orangutans than, you know, than we don't have in common with them. We have a tremendous amount in common with them. And they do use language and so forth. So we can't get away from that animal spirit while we're incarnate in a physical body. But what happens 
when the chimp dies, is the chimp going to go on to a higher consciousness? This is a question. This is not an answer. What happens when E.T. dies? That's the question I always like to throw out there. Does E.T. have a life review? Is E.T. a biological entity is my well, answer. Yeah, well, I mean, question. I think, uh, again, I would, I would cast it back as you so aptly did in the, if we accept the wide variety of possible things that exist in the extended realm. I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that ET is real on some, on some physical material level may also be real on this interdimensional level, but you know, I mean, first you'd have to come back and ask really the tough questions about our reality, you know, and like the near death experience people and a lot of people have, entered the extended realm, what they'll tell you is this isn't real here. You know, you're experiencing it, you're playing with it and you're calling it real, but it's less than real and there's a greater reality. But it does seem to me, and I, I'm very open to hearing your interpretation of it, but the, you know, I think Jacques Vallée is kind of misunderstood and I interviewed him on Skeptico and I tried to pin him down on this, but it didn't take much to pin him down. He's open about it. He goes, yeah, sure. You want to talk about consciousness, extended consciousness, interdimensional, I'm there. But I'm also down with the fact that there's a real physical presence that's interacting with people. And we can't deny the fact that they're leaving behind, you know, this trace evidence. Trace evidence. And it's layered in this way that we have no way of creating on this earth and all the rest of that all points to. Yeah. Well, and then you, you interviewed Diana Walsh Pasolka too, and you were a little bit too easy on her because you did that girl to girl thing, but that's all right. I know you, women got to stick together. I get it. But it's, she's found the same thing. So, you know, space junk in the desert kind of thing. So it's like, yeah, I mean, ET is, there's some ET that's biological and what is their relationship to consciousness? And then do they have a, do they have a, when they have their after death experience, What's their life review like? Because life review, you know, getting back to evil, life review is a great window into what we're talking about here. Because when near-death experiencers come back, and you Not interviewed, you interviewed Greg, true, but you, you interviewed Gregory Shushan too, Dr. Gregory Shushan. Yes. yes. Which is interesting because if people don't know, you know, he's done the cross-cultural cross time look at near death experiences. And he doesn't come back and say, gee, they all look just like Jeff Long's. He kind of says something a little different than that. But the big picture is kind of the, the same. And the thing about the life review is that you review. There isn't some other one making a judgment on should you have killed that elephant? Or should you have not killed that elephant? Or should you have stopped that guy from raping and then murdering that kid? or not, you will be the one who judges that. And I think that changes, that changes everything. And I think that there's a parallel for, to what we need to do here. We don't need to make that judgment. We need to make that judgment as a society in terms of who we lock up. But beyond that, it's like, your karma, bro. Well, I still can't get away from the idea that we are incarnate as you know, a biological thing, which is an animal, and that we have certain instinctual um, actions that we might take. So there's that. And I don't really have an answer for that. And in terms of Diana Walsh, Pasolka, I was very happy to get her on Shattered Reality Podcast. But we had a little bit of a history because while I was reading her book, I was in Rome. And I had so many things happen around the Vatican and around her and a book that I brought to read with me uh, by accident. And it, it became like all these synchronicities between the two of us that in, involved also a woman who is somewhat known in UFO circles named um, uh, Brenda Densler, uh, who I know only on the internet and through groups and stuff, but I know her pretty well. And she was involved with it. And so there were all these, like I was at the Vatican and um, the night after I left the Vatican, I fell on my face 
in a, and, and I hurt myself really badly. And it was like this whole, everything was connected. It's, it, it's impossible even to talk about it in 10 paragraphs here. But the, what you- Try, the, try though, because it's an amazing story. And then when you talked with Dr. Uh, Pasolka, what she said was that you are not the only one who's had these extraordinary experiences connected with this one spirit being saint being so just recap for for folks for Risha because it's it's amazing and again you're not catholic you're not christian so it's like you're not christian right you know i i don't i i was i was a lutheran when i was a little girl okay um i i'm probably easier on religious people than you are to an extent simply because i realize that there are a lot of people who are not free thinkers and need to follow someone i don't need that Crush. How condescending! How condescending of you to think that there are. I kind of agree. I kind of mean it. But tell the story. Tell the story about the saint. Because again, Pasolka says this is my experience, and I got tons of people who write in and tell me their accounts that exactly match yours. But you're a, a public figure who's ha experienced it. Well, I would have to say that it started off with Michael Grosso who I've had on a few times. And um, it, it also involves um, people from the Monroe Institute who went to Europe and saw nuns levitating. Uh, two women who I know, one of whom is passed on, uh, uh, lived in Spain. The woman lived in Spain. She was briefly the head of the Monroe Institute and she uh, was living in Spain at the time and she went to a convent for what reason I've forgotten and she brought with her this Danish woman who also was in the Monroe Institute somehow and the two of them saw this nun levitating in the distance and the Danish woman whoop, she fell flat on her face it was too much for her psyche to absorb she fainted but um, the other woman, um, you know, became some form of a believer, not in Catholicism, but just in the extended realm to a greater extent. And uh, Michael Grosso, of course, wrote his book about the, uh, the John figure, St. John. I'm all, all of a sudden, I'm losing the name of the book. It's this Benedictine monk, monk who was observed by a bunch of people in the monastery to on a regular, <laughs> on a regular basis levitate and just kind of walk outside of the, the clock tower and people saw this and they wrote it down and they were eyewitnesses and it's like, Hundreds. yeah, Hundreds and it, 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 it's like if you deny it, it's like, I don't know on what basis you would deny, you know, just because it's like something they said they saw. The church tried to suppress it basically. And finally, the evidence was overwhelming. And so they just let him, they gave him a pass. They tried to sort of keep him under wraps. They gave it a pass and he eventually proceeded to sainthood. However, his female counterpart, which was the woman, Mary of Agreda, I believe, who came uh, and who was seen by Native Americans having uh, trans transposed herself into the Southwest desert and um, became known to these Native Americans as the, the blue lady, the white lady or something like that. She, she came, she gave teachings and it was totally non-physical and it was also provable. And I believe Diana was very much involved with her. And um, when I went to Italy, I was not going for the re I was just going for a vacation, but uh, it was to Rome and I wanted to see uh, Pompeii. So I took a, a bus ride to Pompeii and walked around and saw those people all under ash. It was quite fascinating because I never realized that it was exactly that close to Naples. It's that close to Naples. So that's just personal. But in any case, I had brought with me a book and the book that I brought with me uh, just grabbed something off the shelf uh, that I hadn't read. It was a, a crime book. And it turned out to be all about um, the religious uh, things that were going on from the point of view of Mossad and uh, very frightening stuff. But it all fed into the Diana Walsh Pasalka story as well with 
the um, the Catholic um, uh, the observatory, the a astrophysics area, and they went in there and everything. And I'm saying, holy jeez, I'm re I got the Diane Walsh Pasalka book on my computer here, and I'm reading that for Shattered Reality podcast. And then I brought this book for entertainment. Not so much. It's all like totally interwoven. And I and I went to the to the Vatican and uh, walked around and saw a lot of the stuff that she was referencing, and it was all you know cool. It was interesting. And then uh, I went to eat dinner at a at a place we eat with kind of situation, and I fell down and I busted my lip wide open, and it was really revolting. And I had to go to a to the emergency room, and I was really laid up pretty bad. And, um, and so on my way back after all these adventures in Italy, um, I was sitting on the airplane trying to meditate and I saw this woman sitting uh, like where there are no seats. It's, it's not the bulkhead, it's where there's, it's not the wing, it might, there's something that's there and it, it skips a couple of skips maybe two rows of seats towards the back of the airplane. And um, I would meditate, you know, I had it sort of like semi-open-eyed meditation, and I kept feeling this woman being there. And every time I really looked, it was, she wasn't there, but she was there, and unmistakably. It wasn't just something that I was imagining, and like really just fevered dreams because I was fully awake, though I was in, uh, I guess, alpha state of, uh, of brain waves. And I just got the feeling it was good old Brenda Densler, who wrote, who once wrote a book about UFOs, and um, who I didn't know at the time, had given Diana Walsh Pasolka a whole bunch of her library and her research. I had no idea the two knew each other at all, at all. And I just thought, oh my gosh, what's Brenda doing here and why? And, and then when I spoke with Diana, she said she was sure it was uh, St. Mary of Agreda, which I think, who I think is actually not a saint, but Mary of Agreda. Um, and I said, okay, I thought it was Brenda Densler. And then she comes out with, well, yeah, I know Brenda Densler too. And it was like, oh. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm missing parts of the story, but it was just, it was mind bending. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think, you know, the other part of that is that, so then Diana proceeds to tell you that she's had many people report encounters with her book, American Cosmic, which is a fantastic book. If anyone hasn't read it, it's like a very important book to read. And it's, fantastically entertaining, but it's just important in terms of this invisible college thing, in terms of the kind of way secrets are, are held around this topic of uh, UFOs, and then, you know, even touching on the, the spiritual part of it too, right? But, but she's had a number of people come forward and say they've had a connection with this saint through her through her and book. she converted to Catholicism as, you know, she was always a uh, spiritual child and she actually converted to Catholicism. But what I find interesting, you know, as I said, the history, the things that are interesting about Catholicism from my point of view is that also they're extremely interested in UFOs and you got to ask yourself why. And they do maintain these observatories around the world. So well, there's what, some. What's your answer to that question? To me, I, I don't get that. When you say that, what's the answer to that question? Because it would have to be a complete, ultimate conspiracy. That is, that is, that is not at all what they claim. They don't claim to be interested in UFOs. They claim to have a direct line to. God and the son of the one and only son of the only begotten son of God. That is their position. And they, they kind of do this little dance of like, ooh, you know, sent out. The, they're, they're like the CIA, you know, or like our government here. You know, they put out these kind of cryptid. Well, I don't know. What would you think about that? They're not upfront about about what they think or what they believe. And they certainly don't let people in to see any of their secret documents. Oh. They didn't let me in to see their secret documents, but uh, <laughs> I didn't ask on the other hand, but be that as it may, I think that 
what we're talking about here is a smaller version of what people talk about when they talk about the United States government. It ain't just one thing. So, you know, but from a spiritual standpoint, is that what we want? I don't understand why. I don't understand that. I mean, I'm interested in spirituality, but my understanding of spirituality is nudging towards this ultimate truth, you know, to put it in kind of new age terms, to get closer to the light, that all loving, all encompassing light that near death experiencers, researchers talk about and experiencers talk about. And to me, it seems pretty straightforward. You know, I, I, there's a moral imperative. There seems to be a right and wrong. We have discernment. I do seem to have discernment. I do seem to know what's right and what's wrong. And I can make that choice. It's so freaking simple. Why do I need a religion to connect with any of that? And then it is incredibly condescending to say, well, you don't need it, Alex, but there's some stupid you know, follower people out there that need it. I don't buy that. I think, I think people are, I don't know. I think that pretty people smart. Could, be better, could, could be better served than how they are served by many religions um, beyond Catholicism and other religions. I think even those folks could be better served. But I do think that some people don't question uh, consciousness like you do or like I do. And for those people, they need a place in their life to put that, they compartmentalize. And, uh, you know, am I saying people are stupid? Not so much as, uh, as I'm saying that people choose in their life to focus on different areas. Now, um, you know, there's a guy out there who focuses on football. I have absolutely no interest in sports. It just is totally uninteresting to me as a human being. But there's that guy who focuses on football. He thinks about God. He kisses his Christian medal to win the, um, the uh, uh, to get the pass or to uh, make the touchdown or whatever the heck it is. I don't know. And And to me and you, that may seem, ridiculous but this is the way he has compartmentalized the spiritual aspect of his life now could that man be better served absolutely uh, he's not being well served by by religions in general which require a following which require more times than not that you follow some man wearing a dress and believe that whatever he says is what you ought to follow I can't do that, you can't do that, but I think that's because perhaps your area of interest and my area of interest are far different from his. But could he be better served by a spiritual advisor? Absolutely. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, I think we, we've maybe pulled that as far as we can. <laughs> you know, we, we ought to move towards kind of concluding this we're, we've been at it for an hour and a half it's been just a terrific chat i love wow i didn't chatting. realize it was that long <laughs> it's it's good time flies when you're having fun as they absolutely. say absolutely absolutely so do, do we have do you have any other thoughts on what i should be considering in terms of why evil matters why it's we we kind of really took different points of view, like on the ivory hunter, that's exactly what I don't want to get into. To me, that is, that is far from the spiritual, you know? Yeah, but, I don't, uh, I don't need to get further into that. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's so hard because as people have said on your show, you can't study something with the something that you are studying. And I think that's really the biggest problem in, in what we're talking about. Um, if I were to write a book about evil, I probably would look more at uh, a perspective of, of uh, not human, uh, like, what is human and 
are humans on the top of this scale? Because I don't look at humans as the crown of creation. And um, I would kind of look at where, what is the human part of it versus the way other creatures, both incarnate and discarnate, might see the concept. And that's where I would stand. That's an awesome perspective. And it's one that, that I hadn't fully considered. And I love the way you put it out before, you know, because I kind of jumped on the animal thing. But you also said, what about the trees thing? You know, and have you heard about that guy? Uh, he's a German researcher who did the research. You should have him on your show. You guys would have a great time. But he took it purely from a scientific biological standpoint. Did you know this, this work I'm talking about? And he said the connection and the communication of these trees, you know, and how I got, some. I got the same thing from a woman. I'm, I don't know the German guy, but I'd love to have his name, but I was going to bring up a woman whose name, of course, I, I can't find right at, at the moment. Maybe it's here somewhere in my notes. And we find these trees are actually, he found these trees are actually like battling each other, you know, like this grove of trees is trying to keep out the other trees or that trees aren't as happy, you know, this anthropomorphizing a little bit, but he has the data to back it up. These kind of trees don't like being alone, you know, don't just go plant them alone in a, under a, a, tr a lamppost. They don't like that. And, you know, all these things that, again, approaching it from a scientific basis and has the data to support. What are you saying? I, I had a woman um, whose name I don't have in front of me right at the moment, but uh, she may be Canadian. I think she is Canadian and she talks about the same things. And just as a final note, I am sitting here and I have a cat looking out the window uh, of, of my, my place here. Cat is looking out the window and he's looking at three squirrels who come up on the chair next to the window to look at him, make faces at him, and taunt him. Now, he is a big, mean, black cat. I mean, he's, he can be mean. He's not always mean. But he's, he wants to eat them up. And they know it. And they're just going, nah, 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 nah. you can't get us. And they are absolutely communicating. You just know that they are absolutely communicating right now one of them is sitting right on the chair, looking in the window and sticking his tongue out at the cat. So, well, you know, I have a cat sitting over uh, six feet over to me on the left and just a quick cat story because, uh, so we have a, we've had a lot of foster dogs in our house. I mean, really my wife has driven that process, but we've had 50 or 60 foster dogs over the years. But recently Margo has decided enough on the dogs, you know, but she has always had this ability to kind of tell which are the good dogs and which are the bad dogs. You know, so if we're going to have it, you know, these foster dogs, they're, they're kind of some rough characters sometimes, you know, street dogs and stuff like that. And she just at the beginning will be like attacking one and that dog will turn out to be kind of a dangerous dog, bite other people that come in the house or, you know, snap at them and stuff like that. And other dogs, you know, like we had this huge mastiff, you know, 180 pounds. And she's like, all right, he, he's okay. You know, it, have that kind of ability, you know. People do. People do. I feel like uh, having a lot of, of kinship here with your wife because I can walk down a strange street and stop and go, pss, 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 and 10 cats will come out from a, and they'll all come up to me because they know, they just know that you love them and you want the best for them. So I'm, I'm all for cats and dogs and other creatures, though I've never really been able to get too intimate with insects. I do love lightning bugs. <laughs> awesome. Well, Farouche, it's been awesome connecting again and, uh, and talking and uh, what a great opportunity. Yes. You, 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 it's been great speaking to you, and sometimes you'll have to tell me about the main painting behind you. The one in the middle? Okay. Yes. You know, I, I just, you know, somebody asked me about it. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Martin asked me about it. I don't know if it made it in the show, so it might be boring to people, but uh, my wife and I were down in Mexico. We live in San Diego, so Mexico's really close. And we were down there years ago, and, you know, she's kind of, walking me through the streets, you know, doing the shopping thing. And I'm just like dragging along. And this guy comes out and he comes up to me and he goes, Hey, come here. 
come here, I want to show you something. And he takes me all the way in the back of his shop. I mean, you know, you don't know if this stuff is staged or not, but it was fantastic. He goes, you're looking for art. I want to show you something. And he shows me this and a couple other carvings that this guy has done. And he goes, this guy is a, a, a native guy who is way, way out in the, in the bush and he does these incredible carvings and I go down there and get a few of them every now and then. And it's just amazing stuff. And it is, I mean, this is a, there's like, if you can see it, there's this human being that's coming up out of the mud, you know, and there's like these snakes in front of him and stuff like that. And then the gnosis, the, 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 the wisdom is being blown into his head like a cloud and then it's spinning into this star and i mean some people see some very occult things in there but Sean i just thought it was cool you know i just thought it was a cool painting or carving must have been a real sha a shaman i'd say yes i i never met the got the actual artist but yeah i mean he's tapping into some pretty deep stuff there huh well thank you alex thank you for